All right, so you're a game master, and you want to try running Pathfinder 2nd Edition's beginner box adventure, The Menace Under Otari. This adventure, in my humble opinion, is wonderful and does so many great things in terms of showcasing common mechanics and common rules to you and your players for Pathfinder 2nd Edition. But as a game master who has run this particular adventure dozens of times at this point, and while I do think that it is fantastic, there are some things you can improve about it in terms of some encounters and other things like that. But hello everyone, my name is Nate Mun, and in this video, I'm going to be covering my big changes that I made to the Menace Under Otari adventure to improve the experience for you and your players. All of the changes that I'm going to be talking about in this video are changes that my players have expressed to me that they wish were changed, or some things that I personally saw and tweaked a little bit about the adventure to make the overall experience more enjoyable for the players. But without further delay, let's... Greetings everyone. It is I, the wizard known as Cautious Disclaimerus the Wary. If you have not run or played in the Menace Under Otari adventure, please know that this video covers some aspects and information about the adventure that many would consider to be spoilers. But now that you have been warned, my duty has been fulfilled. Now then, let us resume the video. Jump right into things! So normally the adventure is technically supposed to begin with the players introducing themselves to each other in the Otari fishery after receiving the letter from Tamily and then diving right into the dungeon. While I do think that this particular method of starting the adventure is great, especially if you want to get right into the action and start the adventure, it does skip over a lot of potentially fun role-playing opportunities, especially if you're running the adventure for experienced TTRPG players who like to role-play their characters, in terms of talking with Tamily and other NPCs around Otari. So the first thing that I did in terms of changes was with the plot hook, because what I did was I made Tamily Tanderville a good friend of the characters and the adventurers who come to aid her, as opposed to it just being random adventurers who she sends a letter to after hearing about them and so forth. This way it kind of makes it so that we have a personal agency in terms of helping Tamily and also can lead to some fun role-playing aspects in terms of your character's backstory and all that kind of stuff. But one thing I do want to mention is if you're going to be plugging this adventure into an adventure that is already running, and you already have characters with their backstories all lined up and things like that, you may just want to keep the original plot hook, if that makes sense. I also normally change this section of the introductory paragraph to be optional, so that way the players don't feel forced to have grown up in Otari, but I'm sure to mention that it's still pretty important to at least be a local or live in or around Otari. But anyways, then I modified the plot hook a little. So my plot hook reads as the following. You have recently received a letter from Tamily Tanderville, a good friend of yours who owns the Otari fishery. This letter that you received included a desperate plea for help as well as a strange shopping list. She writes that the town guard is too busy protecting the loggers to help her with her infestation and that she needs a few brave souls to venture down into the cellar of her fishery and put an end to whatever is feasting on her fish. The letter ends with, Oh, and if you wouldn't mind picking up the items on the shopping list for me, that'd be just dandy. I'll of course pay you back. Whatever is in my cellar has ruined all of the food and equipment down there, and I haven't had the chance to escape to the marketplace quite yet. <laughs> so you'd be really helping me out by doing that. Whatever is on the shopping list is completely up to you, but generally I like to tell my players that it includes things such as hammers, nails, uh, parchment paper, knives, and maybe some groceries like some fruit or maybe some other things that she uses for her meals at the fishery and stuff like that. But one thing I'm sure to mention to my players is that each list is exactly the same, which leads me to saying this after I'm done describing the atmosphere of the marketplace. As you're making your rounds in the marketplace, and perhaps begrudgingly picking up the items on your dear friend Tamily's list, you can't help but notice that there are others who seem to be picking up the same items that you are. While this isn't a super uncommon occurrence, what is uncommon and strange is that you see these individuals going to the same stalls that you go to and purchasing the same items that you're purchasing. Perhaps they're mocking you, or perhaps they're following you, or perhaps, yes, perhaps they're also here for the same reason you are. You turn to get a better look at them to see if you recognize any of them. And with that, Nate. Please describe your character. And this is just one of two methods that I like to use in terms of starting the campaign and helping the players naturally introduce their characters. And this is also a good point to ask the characters if their characters know each other, or if some of them are strangers, or maybe haven't seen each other in a very long time and so forth, if you haven't already asked them that before the campaign began. And then, once the players are done interacting with one another, role-playing for a little bit, introducing their characters and maybe other NPCs in the marketplace and so forth, that's when combat begins. Because as the players are finishing their shopping spree for Tamily, and perhaps are done role-playing with one another, 
they begin to hear a low rumbling noise as all of the sounds and ambience of the marketplace begin to fade away, and then emerging from the ground in an explosion of dirt, stone, and rubble are four giant centipedes that begin attacking the marketplace. And then as that happens, all of the characters, being the natural born heroes that they are, immediately dive into the fray to save the people of Otari, and with that I ask everyone to roll for initiative, thus kicking the adventure off with a bang. And then after the encounter is over, I normally have a group of guards or militia run up wondering what all the commotion was about, and then perhaps drop a little bit of exposition talking about how these desperate attacks from the centipedes have been happening all over Otari. But after this encounter comes to a close, and as your players are perhaps being hailed as heroes, or maybe as the guards are telling them about all these other desperate attacks from the centipedes around Otari, this may begin to have your players begging the question, why are the centipedes attacking Otari to begin with, and what has caused them to be so desperate? And this adds a bit of foreshadowing, perhaps, for what lies ahead. And if you don't like the shopping list plot hook, then you can still run this encounter. You can just have your players, or more so their characters, be in the marketplace purchasing their adventuring equipment before they go to the fishery. And for full transparency, that encounter was actually inspired by the story seed given in the Otari Gazetteer, A Bad Day at the Market. I just cut out the bit about the goblins, and then obviously made it a little bit more friendly in terms of it being a level 1 encounter at the very beginning of an adventure. But as I had kind of mentioned before, and in my personal opinion, this small change to the beginning of the adventure makes the adventure flow a little bit more naturally, and includes a little bit of foreshadowing as to what is lurking in the depths beneath Otari. But then, after this encounter, the players naturally begin to make their way to the fishery to meet up with their good friend, Tamley Tanderville. It's at this point that I normally encourage the players to talk to Tamley about what lurks in her cellar, or perhaps to roleplay with each other a little bit more. And I also like to include a little dialogue from Tamley, where she mentions that times have been tough for her ever since word has gotten out that there is a monster in her basement, which allows you to modify the amount of gold she gives the party if you want to, and adds a bit more urgency to the main quest. But once they're done roleplaying with Tamley, each other, or perhaps other NPCs in the fishery for a little bit, that is when the adventure truly begins as they begin to descend into the cellar beneath the fishery. And I don't believe the adventure actually talks about where the entrance to the cellar, or more so perhaps the underground warehouse of the fishery actually is, so I like to put it in the kitchen of the fishery, which leads to a little dialogue encounter with Tamley's employee, the orcish chef Brug, who is currently brewing a very large pot of orcish slop which is essentially just a bunch of random scraps of food thrown into a pot, boiled, and then eaten. And it reeks and smells terrible, but it leads to a very fun encounter where Brug is perhaps withholding the key because he wants the characters and Tamley to taste his slop and give their honest opinions about it, or perhaps maybe he accidentally drops the key into the slop, which leads another character have to go fishing around for it and stuff like that. And in my humble opinion, as well as my players' opinions, they really like this encounter because it adds a little bit more life to the fishery itself and can lead to some funny encounters in terms of role playing situations with the characters and Brug every single time they enter and leave the dungeon, or every time they enter into the kitchen. But then, like normal, the party delves into the cellar, deals with the rats, descends into the cave further, and enters into the spider's lair. No change is necessary, or at least not in my opinion. And if for some reason you have one wet blanket sourpuss player who is over roleplaying their character and wants to leave the cellar immediately after dealing with the rats, which completely throws off the tempo of the campaign, then maybe mention that they see a strange light coming from beyond the breach in the eastern wall, which are the giant mushrooms. Or if that doesn't work and you want to really incentivize your players to delve deeper into the dungeon, perhaps when they go back up to the fishery, they come across Tamale, who is currently talking to Rin Savinsky, who offers to pay the party a certain amount of gold to find a particular room of elements that seemingly was built and forgotten underneath the Otari fishery. And she suspects that the caverns that the players had come across connects to a series of ruins that connects to this room of elements and she's willing to pay the party to find this room and deliver any information that they gather to Rin. Which could be a good side quest for the party, or could obviously be another incentivizer for the party to continue deeper into the dungeon if they feel that they have completed their obligation, task, or their more so their quest, I should say, that Tamley had requested them for. But moving on and going back into the dungeon to the spider and hidden crypt encounters. With these, I change a couple of things. Firstly, I like to make the spider encounter a little bit more difficult by adding in an additional spider, which upgrades the encounter from trivial to moderate if you have a group of four level 1 characters. The reason why I do this is because normally I run this adventure with four of the five players, and I found that despite the look of the room, it didn't really pose any of a threat to the party because there was only one monster in it. So by adding an additional spider, it makes things a little bit more challenging, but still manageable. But with that being said, definitely do not run this encounter with two spiders if you have a group of three or less players, and be sure to really assess 
the frontline capabilities for your group. And even when I run the encounter with a group of four or more players, I generally downgrade one of the spiders to weak depending upon the group dynamic. So if there are two or maybe more frontline characters, normally I keep it at two spiders, just no changes to their overall stats. But if there are only two, maybe only one frontliner, then I change it to potentially only one spider or one spider and a weakened spider. And regarding the webs in this room, I make them pretty difficult to burn. So if a character or multiple characters light a torch and begin attempting to burn the webs away, it doesn't just catch everything on fire immediately. And I make sure to explain to the players that the webs can burn, but would require some more oomph or condensed fire to truly set them on fire in the way that they're hoping. The reason why I've done this is because I've had a lot of clever and experienced players take one look at this room and immediately start setting everything on fire by throwing torches into it. But by making the webs a little bit more difficult to burn based off of one character's effort, this encourages the players to work together and come up with a creative idea in terms of drying out the webs or setting some of them on fire and then thus catching a portion of the webs on fire. And while setting the room on fire immediately is a good idea, technically from our standpoint as the game master, during the first couple of times I ran this encounter professionally, I found that a lot of players just cheesed this room by lighting torches and throwing them into the webs to completely incinerate the single giant spider that the players assumed was lurking in here and us being the game masters knew was in that room, thus making the room a complete joke despite it looking super menacing. So by adding an additional spider to this room's encounter, and by making the webs difficult to set on fire by yourself, it does make things more difficult if players want to brute force it, but if the players are clever and persistent, I like to reward those players who want to set the whole room ablaze by using their spells or torches. So if the players continue attempting to set the webs on fire and succeed, I have the room filled with the high-pitched screeches of the spiders, and combat begins. But one of the spiders is currently taking persistent fire damage, and it took six fire damage as a result of the blaze. This rewards the clever players by making the encounter a little bit easier, and is a great way to introduce persistent damage and gives this room a super memorable moment. And if you're running this adventure for three or less players, then this allows them to kind of skip over this encounter and dodge potentially a very dangerous encounter for them but I would still recommend the spider partially live through the fire or at least come running at the players on fire so that way you can still introduce persistent damage and still give the players a bit of a fright when a flaming spider comes rolling at them. But moving on to the crypt, with this room I did the opposite of what I did in the spider room. I remove one skeleton from the encounter if I'm running the adventure for a group of three or less and I place a zombie shambler in the coffin closest to the entrance. While this room is meant to be challenging if you're introducing new players to the game who have no experience with TTRPGs, this room can be super deadly if you're not careful. So with this room, I've found that if you run the encounter with five enemies, especially if you have a group of four or less players, it can potentially TPK the party if you're not too careful. Which is why I leave one of the skeletons kind of on standby, if that makes sense. So what I do is I leave one of the skeletons in one of the coffins, struggling to get out. And if the encounter becomes very easy, then I have him erupt from the coffin. But if he becomes super difficult, and potentially a boss encounter, I guess, and a deadly encounter, I leave that skeleton struggling to get out. So I err on the safe side and remove one skeleton just in case. But trust me, it doesn't take away from the encounter at all. And narratively, I just roleplay that skeleton showing up late to the encounter as that skeleton struggling to get out of their coffin, if that makes sense. But you may be thinking to yourself, okay, I get removing the skeleton for the sake of making the encounter a little bit easier, but why move the zombie? Because then what comes out of the coffin in the middle of the room? And the answer to that question is, nothing! Instead, I turn the sarcophagus into a puzzle. So according to the description of the room, there is only meant to be one torch giving this room light. But with the updated Foundry battle map, there are some sconces that are mounted around the room that I found some inspiration in. So I added some blue fire effects courtesy of JB2A to the sconces to set the mood for this room a little bit more. And then there is this torch here that I assume is meant to be the ever-burning torch that players can take with them if they so choose. But since it sticks out like a sore thumb and doesn't have any fire effects added to it by default, that's where I got my idea. So what I did was turn the player's curiosity towards the sarcophagus in the middle of the room into a very simple puzzle. So what I did was make the sarcophagus very difficult to open with raw strength. So I set the DC for cracking it open with a bit of elbow grease at a DC 21 athletics check. Difficult, yes, but still very possible for most first level characters. By doing this, it makes the players think that there is another method of cracking open the stone treasure vault besides using brute force, and especially perceptive players will notice that all of the sconces in this room are aflame, but the only torch in the room is not. 
This leads your smart players to light the torch either using their own flame or the flames from the sconces, which opens the sarcophagus immediately, revealing the treasure therein. And if the players are struggling a little bit with this puzzle, I always allow them to roll a perception check to notice perhaps that the sconces are aflame, but the torch is not, to give them a little bit of a hint. But now moving on, pretty much everything remains the same up until the Grand Hall Room, aka the Kobolds and Traps section. The one thing I did add though was another layer to the gold coin puzzle. I decided to make this little gold coin handout with holy symbols on one side so that if players are struggling to figure out the puzzle the intended way, they can roll a religion check if they're trained in it to try and suss out which of the coins is a deception. And the answer is this one, which has the holy symbol of Calistria, the goddess of trickery. But anyways, with the kobolds and traps room, I honestly don't have that big of an issue with anything in here, but I do think that while the trap in this room could be easily avoided by not activating it at Abadar's vault, or the kobolds in this room could go first on initiative and trigger it before the heroes, it can still be pretty deadly if it is activated and the players end up going first when initiative begins. So with this room, the adventure assumes that the kobolds will go first and trigger the trap, and if they don't, well, then that's a bummer for you and your party. And because of this, I've had situations happen before where the only martial character in the group went first on initiative, stepped up into the trap, triggered it, and then got hit by it after failing his reflex save, and then went down, thus leaving his party members to the mercy of the kobolds. So, as I'm sure you can imagine, my trauma from that situation combined with another small gripe I have with this encounter, which we'll cover in a little bit, and also combined with the fact that I didn't have any cool animations for a sprone spike trap, led me to change a couple of things about this room. So what I did was instead of making this whole massive area the trap, I decided to make the pillars the trap. So on every side of each pillar, besides the back of it, I made it so that whenever a token walks across it, while the trap is active, a spike trap activates. And regarding the trap's save and damage, I kept the reflex save the same, but changed the damage to 1d6 plus 4 as opposed to 1d8 plus 4. And regarding activating the trap, I made it so that when a player activates the mechanism, there is a very audible steamy burst sound that fills the room, which could lead a kobold to investigate what the sound was and then potentially getting skewered by one of the spike traps. By doing this, it reveals what the mechanism does to the player and can make the next encounter a little easier if you happen to be running the adventure for a smaller group. But again, that's only if you want to be really lenient with your players and really show them what the mechanism does as opposed to them trying to figure it out for themselves and also killing one of the kobolds in the next encounter, thus making it a little bit easier. But when it comes to the combat encounter in this room, I felt like it should be a little bit more epic than just a trap and a couple of kobold warriors and a single kobold trap master, who according to the adventure, spends her first three turns setting traps, which is a three action ability by the way. So I made the kobold trap master a little bit more aggressive by making her attack with her kobold friends until one of them goes down, in which case she then begins to retreat and set up traps like normal to cover her escape. At the very least, I have her spend one turn moving into position and attacking before deciding to retreat and set up traps. And normally she ends up getting taken out before she even manages to completely secure her escape with traps, but in the event where she is near death or takes a lot of damage, I have her ditch the idea of setting up traps and have her flee for her life. And I will say normally, or at least in my experience, the Kobold Trap Master almost never really gets the chance to set up all of her traps, because normally the players deal with the other kobolds and get to her, normally within one or two rounds depending upon how well they're rolling, and then by that point, the Kobold Trap Master is either very wounded or sometimes even near death, again depending upon the player's rolls. But in that event, where the Kobold Trap Master is reduced to below half HP or potentially near death, what I do is have the Kobold Trap Master completely give up on setting up her traps and then flee down the staircase. And normally, <laughs> I say normally, the characters don't pursue because they realize, okay, these kobolds have set up traps from the rooms previous, and normally there's always one player who is a little bit more sane than the other players and tries to hold the other ones back and says, no, 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 wait, there could be traps, let's rest and recuperate, or let's go back up to Otari and purchase items and stuff like that. And then normally what occurs is after the encounter ends, normally the session ends as well, since that's normally how the session, or more so the campaign, plays out in terms of the time frame of the sessions, as well as the pacing of the campaign itself. But the big change that I make to this room and the encounter overall is that once the players, or more so the characters, complete this encounter, they level up to level 2. The reason why I do this is because of the length of the adventure. Generally, it takes my groups anywhere from 3 to 4 sessions to complete the Menace under Otari adventure. Maybe 5 if they are constantly going back up to Otari or spending a lot of time roleplaying with each other. But since they normally reach this portion of the dungeon by session 2, that means that they only have 1, sometimes 2 sessions to play around with their new abilities and features, which isn't a whole lot of time in my opinion. 
And normally the adventure calls for your players to level up at the end of the Kobold Warren encounter, but in my humble opinion, that is normally during mid-session for me, and I generally don't like having level up sessions in the middle of my sessions if that makes sense, because it not only gives your players a limited time frame to choose their options and immediately level up, but also for this particular encounter and the adventure I should say, that doesn't give the players a whole lot of time to really play around with their new features and abilities that they recently acquired. And it's because of this that I generally like to have my players level up at the end of the first level of the dungeon because it makes sense, and my players normally at this point, especially if they're coming over from other game systems, feel like they've done more than enough to level up to level 1, and it gives the players a little bit more time to obviously choose their options and features because again, like I said before, generally my sessions come to a close at the end of the first level anyways, and first level of the dungeon that is, and of course it gives the players more time in terms of sessions to actually play with their abilities abilities and toy around with what mechanics that they get from those abilities. And if you're worried about the encounters in the next level being super easy because the characters are now level 2 before they should be, I will tell you that honestly, like in my, at least in my opinion, all those encounters are still very much challenging and still pose a threat to the characters, even if it's a very large group. And if you feel like that that shouldn't be the case for your adventure, then obviously you can continue with the base rules, but that's just how I like to spin it. But that's all for floor number one, and now we're on to dungeon floor number two. So pretty much everything on this floor stays the same. The only things I change are the final boss and a small tweak to the Kobold Warren encounter. So I've noticed over the many times that I've run this adventure, there are maybe a total of five times that the players actually let one of the Kobolds surrender at the end of the Kobold Warren encounter, or actually let the Kobold speak and try to barter with the players for information. And it's because of this that I change how the kobolds react during the encounter. So instead of having the last kobold begin to grovel and beg for his life, I have the kobold begin to run towards the dragon keeper chamber, and generally, they never even make it up one or two of the cliffs before they get shot by one of the other players, or one of the players manages to catch up to them and kill it before it manages to escape. And you may be worried thinking to yourself, well, okay, well if the player kills all the kobolds, then how do they learn any information about the future rooms and potentially the final boss? And that's where Scraz comes into play. Scraz is the shy, scrawny runt of the kobolds who is currently asleep and buried underneath a pile of blankets and straw in the southeastern alcove of the kobold ward. I've generally found that the players like to investigate this room before continuing onwards, so they begin to go around to the alcoves and investigate them, and obviously go up to the treasure chest and begin looting that. But there's always one player who wants to go around and try to see if they can find anything of value or interesting in the alcoves. And then that's when they come across Scraz, pretty easily because he's snoring pretty loudly, even though he is muffled or the, his, the sounds of his snoring is muffled by all the blankets he's currently underneath. And because of this muffled snoring noise, this leads the players to investigate, find Scraz, and normally this leads to a discussion or an interrogation with Scraz, talking about what creatures lie deeper within the dungeon. Scraz is very cooperative since he's naturally intimidated by the heroes and shares everything he knows about what lies ahead. At first, he may be a bit apprehensive about sharing information because he's worried about being bullied by the other kobolds, but he quickly fesses up the information if one of the players attempts to intimidate or comfort him. And he still follows the dialogue guidelines provided by the adventure, but with a much more timid attitude since Scraz is very coy, docile, and doesn't really like the other kobolds anyways since they would always bully him. In my experience running this adventure, I've found that my players love Scraz and immediately try to recruit him into the party after he's done giving them the information that he knows, and generally since he is a very docile kobold as opposed to the other ones that are much more hostile, and because of his very non-threatening demeanor, the players don't end up normally killing him outright and end up getting the information that they need to in terms of what lies ahead. And now that the players have most likely recruited Scraz into their ranks, have continued deeper into the dungeon, defeated the Dragon Keeper, and are about to face the final boss, we come to my last couple of changes with the Menace Under Otari adventure. And I understand that technically this final boss encounter with the Green Dragon Wormling is optional, but I mean, let's be honest, no adventuring party is going to hear the sounds of this monster echoing throughout the cave and ignore that, and they're definitely not going to ignore the treasure chest that they see once they enter into the room with the Green Dragon Wormling. So in my experience, this encounter almost always happens immediately after the players or the characters defeat the Dragon Keeper. But speaking of this encounter, there are two things I change. The first of which is the dragon's AC and sometimes the HP depending upon the size of the party. So I normally don't make the dragon outright weak because I still want it to be difficult and a challenging encounter. But I just want to slightly tweak some things. 
So I normally change the AC from 22 to 21, and if I'm running the adventure for a smaller group, I normally take away 10 HP from it or make it a weak variant altogether. And the second thing I change about this encounter is that I add one or two potions of lesser healing to the dragon's treasure pile. I do this because this particular encounter can turn very deadly very quickly, as I'm sure some of you may know. And it's because of this that I like to add those potions there because a lot of times when I've ran this particular encounter, I've had players begin to look around for any potential options that they have besides outright fleeing the encounter entirely, and a lot of them look towards the treasure chest as being their last ditch effort for making a final stand. So, I like to add in a couple of extra potions in there, depending upon the party size, to give them that fighting chance if necessary. But besides my small tweaks to the dragon's HP and AC, and the lifeline that I add in the form of the potions in the treasure chest, pretty much everything plays out exactly the same in this encounter. And the players either slay the dragon and become heroes of Otari, flee the encounter entirely, or die trying. But those were my big changes to the Menace Under Otari adventure. Leave a like if you liked, and leave a comment down below with your thoughts on some of my changes, or perhaps include some of your own changes that you've made to this adventure. But as always everybody, thank you so much for watching, and I will be sure to catch you, as always, in the next video. Take it easy, Bye bye